So I'm Willy, um, and I will give kind of the state of the union of open biotech and the DIY bio. Um, so DIY bio is do it yourself biology. And I will give some examples from Belgium, uh, but also consider a bit how the global landscape has been forming over the last uh, years. I won't go into too much details because like, there's not so many biotech people here, I imagine, so it will be kind of an overview for those interested. Uh, if you're an expert, this, this might be things that you already know. So uh, my personal journey, it starts about two and a half years ago when my phone was still shitty, so I didn't take very good pictures. Um, and I arrived in our local fab lab with a, a backpack and a plank. Um, because we had kind of made them warm for the idea of having an open biospace, and they said, well, yes, you can do that here. So that's what we did, and I took my backpack and my plank. Uh, and then it was me, just me and a few friends, and we started like, gathering stuff uh, to build equipment to do biology in that room. It was basically just a normal room. Uh, but we started meeting with people every, every week, basically, building and collecting things to do bioscience uh, with. You can see here, uh, there's already like cider fermenting, <laughs> as well as uh, gas being burned and everything that you usually do in biology labs. Uh, we got all of this like uh, vintage lab equipment uh, to cool our beers, uh, <laughs> like whatever you can, you can think of. But it started growing, it started growing. Um, we, we also took in like crazy big machines. Uh, we got a lot of donations, it kind of got out of control uh, a little bit. Uh, but two and a half years later, we're quite, we're quite a vibrant community. This is our, our old lab. Um, it was in a basement, as you see, but it was already quite high tech. Also, thanks to the photographer for making it seem cleaner than it actually was. <laughs> um, now we're in a, we're in a nicer lab. Uh, but it's really a, a community of, of about 50, 60 people that meets every week and that does biosciences. I can talk more, more later about specific examples of what kind of science that we are. Uh, that we are doing. Um, I kind of wanted to stress the importance of biotech here because it's not a very usual suspect in like the open community. Um, but I want to I want to give you like examples of why it's actually quite important. Um, first, kind of a distinction between open biotech or open biology and DIY bio. DIY bio is more of the hacker approach to science where you do stuff with things that you can find in the supermarket or things that are questionable to real scientists, if those words even matter. Um, and open biology is more like how you share the knowledge, uh, more open science related. So they are very heavily overlapped, but they're two distinct things. So uh, very broadly speaking, a bit of history. Biology has been the only technology that has consistently kept us alive since the beginning. We were growing vegetables, doing agriculture, growing animals, so it's quite fundamental to our survival. And then given all our problems with waste and with sustainability, pretty much the future will need to be biological or we will have a very hard time surviving on this planet. So our past and future is basically biological. Now, today is quite complicated and quite complex because as you can see, we're, when you're here in a container of, of pretty much future waste, we're breathing in air that's heavily polluted, we're doing things with genes that we don't really know what we're doing. So today is a bit complex and complicated. And a lot of that is also manifested uh, in DIY bio. And I'm going to go into a little bit of, of where the complications uh, today lie. So today, let's say since the 70s, biotech has kind of been coming up in slow cooking mode. The first genes were edited uh, in the 70s. This is a picture of um, of uh, DNA sequencers. A whole floor of these things was used to, in 2003, sequence the first human genome, letter for letter, C, T, G, A, and so on, and so on. It was first completed in 2003. It was a billion dollar uh, project. Uh, and that was kind of a milestone. It was a collaborative effort, but in 15 years, a lot, of, a lot has changed. The cost of a human genome has dropped at about $1,000, way up from a billion or more than a billion. Um, and this has, of course, created like a lot of uh, exotic applications and a lot of shifts in, in, in what's possible with biotech. Um, an example is gene therapy. It's very fancy uh, technology where you insert genes in a human and they kind of alter your metabolism to correct for genetic disorders that you may have, um, to cure, to even enhance certain parts of your body. Um, 
it's not yet there, but it's very close to being. Uh, there's, there's gene therapies in trial now. Um, this is another example. This is a beanie made from spider silk, but spider silk that was produced in a yeast cell, so it's synthetic spider silk. Um, it's, it can be a sustainable alternative for, for fashion, for textile industry, because it's, it's grown, it's fermented like you. Um, it's not picked and grown. And there's no uh, modern slavery involved, not yet. <laughs> Probably find a way <laughs> anyway. But, um, this is uh, organs on a chip. So this is, again, something futuristic that we couldn't even think of. Uh, basically, this is a chip that simulates human organs uh, that has little chambers that, that perform specific functions. Um, and this would replace the need, for example, for human trials, for, or at least partly for human trials, or for animal trials, for, for example, for medicine. Um, so there's all these crazy things going on with biotech that are very relevant to many industries. Of course, since we're in Belgium, beer is biotech uh, to make sure that your duvel tastes the same every time. There's a lot of biotech uh, involved. Um, and this is all very cool, but actually, like, we've always been biohackers with biotech. Like I, tell, I said about the agriculture, we've been doing it since 9,000 9, years before Christ. We've been growing things, and we've been modifying them. Um, now, with biotech, we're just doing it more efficiently. Um, and more efficiently, well, along the mainstream concept uh, of it. But doing it more efficiently required more resource incentive re intensive research, and, and that also made it proprietary. So growing a vegetable is not patented, but now growing that vegetable a lot better, that's patented. So it's been commodified, and now we can sell it. And, and biotech is basically the selling of what's, what's pretty much already there. I don't need to go too much in detail for it. I have an example with me, like ginger. It's a blood thinner, but pharma doesn't really want to sell ginger. They want to sell pills that thin your blood because it's a lot more expensive. It's a lot more interesting financially. So they do that, and those pills, they are proprietary, whereas ginger actually also works. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. So it makes sense to open it up. What do you need to open biotech up? Firstly, a community that con contributes to the ecosystem. This was recent, in September, there was a meetup in Boston, about, I think, 300 biohackers there met, doing open biotech. Um, so the community is there, it's still growing, but there's a, there's a community there. Uh, this is global, this was from South America, Africa, North America, Europe, uh, Asia, you name it. But here in Belgium, we also have a community. This is our new lab. Well, my phone is better, my photography skills are not. Uh, these are people uh, working uh, at a meetup of ours on open source biomaterials. This is our online community, the Biofab Forum. There you can find open source manuals to make biodegradable building materials. So it's kind of coming. We've grown also from a community of 10 people to about 60 now. Um, it goes slowly, but also other labs are popping up all over Europe of people meeting up every week to do open source uh, biotech stuff. Now, um, a second thing is basic tools. So when you have people, you kind of want to have them use something to make something productive. Uh, this is a picture of open source lab equipment, the kind of thing that you would find in a biology lab, centrifuges, uh, PCR machines, which are copy machines for DNA, um, things like <coughs> that. Basically, biotech is a lot of liquids, pouring liquids together. It's not very spectacular, um, but it's needed. This is a very classical picture of, a, of, of the cost of the genome. So you see, it goes back to when the first human genome was, was sequenced. And the cost of, of sequencing DNA, so reading DNA, has, has really dropped tremendously uh, beyond, beyond prediction. So this, this basically is, is made possible by the, the drop in cost of many, many of the, the things that you use to do biotech. So financially speaking, it's become consumer grade possible to do biotech in your garage pretty easily. If you have a, like a decent job, you can pretty much do it. Uh, also because there's a lot of waste in the industry. The biotech industry is a billion dollar industry, so there's a lot of fallout that you can recuperate. So there are the basic tools, so that's, that's great. Um, now, a big remark, there's a lot of IT people here, and it's always like programming live, synthetic biology, and pictures <laughs> like these where you're like, yes, we're coding A's and T's and G's, and you're just producing proteins and everything. That's not really the case. Uh, it's, it's really hard because once you have your code, it still needs to be in a bacteria or in a yeast, and that's really the hard part. Biotech, in theory, is quite easy. 
give or take, but biotech in, in, in wet work is really hard. Um, that being said, open biotech is also really hard because as opposed to, for example, software, there's a lot of obstacles. So you have your DNA code, which can be proprietary. You can own a piece of DNA as long as it's not natural, if you made it yourself. But then you need to get it in your bacteria because the DNA needs to be in the bacteria to tell it what to produce. Every mechanism from pasting the little pieces of DNA together, that is patented. Then the mechanism for spinning it around in a bottle is patented. And then every mechanism for getting it in your bacteria, it's also patented. And then growing that bacteria itself can also be proprietary. And then, like, you see where I'm going. Every step of the process is, is pretty much proprietary. So it's different than software or different than, than harder, for example, where there's a lot of steps where people are interfering and making it proprietary. So it's, it becomes very, very hard to do something that's completely open source. Uh, the basic tools are not all there yet because we need so many of them. Um, some examples, though, of, of, of projects that are tackling this, that are investing in this shared open uh, infrastructure for biotech, um, is the 10K Genes project. Um, they will ship you free genes. So actually, you can order genes online, Don't like genes with the, with the gene of genes. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see, you can order it online and, um, and they will synthesize it, so they will build it uh, letter for letter and, and ship it to you in the tube, uh, given that you also publish it in an open database online. Uh, so then there's this giant repository of genes that people can use, so that's one of them. Um, now, something I didn't mention, again, an, an, another hard part of biotech is that the theoretical part, the knowledge about it is one thing, but then the biological manifestation of that knowledge, which is the gene in your, in your little tube or the organism in your little tube, they're also protected. They're protected by uh, MTAs, which are material transfer agreements, which say that everything, every piece of biological material needs to have a paper trail to where it was created or where it was made, like where it, where it was entered in the system. If I have a bacteria, I can't just give it to you. There needs to be a paper trail. And these paper trails, or these MTAs, are very restrictive because, of course, it's usually <coughs> in the context of companies or, or, or research institutes, and it's, it's restrictive to also only be logistically possible to transfer it to the same institution. So as a consumer, you, you can't really do it because why? Well, these MTAs are just not there. So it's very hard. So there's, uh, tied to the 10K Genes project, there's an open MTA which, which makes it easier uh, to ship biological material, which is a huge factor because otherwise, uh, everything before that is just theory. You need papers to ship biological material uh, across the world. So yeah, open MTA, 10K genes, these are kind of the basic infrastructure for the boring part of, of open biotech. Um, and then lastly, sorry, when you say that they send you genes, how does it look like? Um, how you a gene looks like? Animal gene, uh, it's small, it's big. <laughs> You can't see it. It's just, it's like, it's really boring. Like, it's, you get just a, you get a, it's just a tube and there's like a few nan nanoliters of liquid in your tube and there's your DNA. You can't see it. It's a transparent liquid. Yeah. Uh, you need to put it on a fluorometer to, to know how much DNA is in there because they send, uh, the meter sends waves through it and then uh, considering the absorbance of the rays, it measures the absorbance and then you know the concentration. So. Everything in biotech, or most things in biotech are like indirect because you can't really see it. Like you can't see bacteria, you can't see genes. It's just tubes with, you're, you're basically all day, what you're doing is with the pipette, you're taking microliters of something and you're putting them there and you're doing that all day and you get a wrist that's like it's broken. <laughs> you don't see anything. So that's biotech. It's, it's like. But it, it's all kind of genes that send you. It, it can be. You it, can be it can be anything. I think. More. They may have like a restriction on, on, on genes that are, can be used for these DIY gene therapies, which will, I will talk about later. So, yeah, I think there's some restrictions, but I, I know the guy who ships it and he says we can't really sell all of it. Like we can't, there's nobody asking for them, so like please, <laughs> take, our, take our genes, yeah. So, yeah, but there's a lot of documentation online, I can, I can uh, get you the information on that. Um, so yeah, when you have the community and the tools, you, you want to do something productive with it because me in my garage alone, uh, I can't do that much uh, because also 
all these steps, it's quite hard. There's failure at every step, synthesizing the DNA, putting it in the bacteria, growing it, then making the protein from that bacteria. Every step is risky, so you want a lot of people to work on this. Uh, so these are some pictures actually from our labs. Um, we are working with just <coughs> regular people who want to learn about biology. We're working with children. We're teaching teachers. We're also working with people with disabilities because we kind of want to open it up to everyone. Um, and the diverse backgrounds of people make, makes it richer, which is the opposite of what biotech usually is done. It's like far, far away in, in white labs where nobody can enter. And yeah, things that happen there are questionable if you don't consult with, with people. So um, they have been, people have been organizing in these biohacker spaces. There's a bit over 100 globally. We are one of them in Ghent. In Belgium, there's not really a lot going on otherwise. Um, I'm going to give some examples of, of projects. So uh, this is a project from, from San Francisco, from Oakland. Real vegan cheese. So the goal is pretty much that. Uh, make vegan cheese with, uh, I think it's yeast or a bacteria. Anyway, the bacteria or the yeast will produce uh, cheese. And then it's, it's non-animal cheese, obviously, because it's made with bacteria. I don't know when the debate around, is it vegan or not, will start. But it's <laughs> vegan for now. Uh, cheese, yeah. Yeah, let's, like, let's leave it at that. That's for the break. Um, another example are actually the DIY gene therapy. So this is maybe NSFW, but um, this is a guy injecting a DIY, so a do-it-yourself uh, cure for herpes, um, because herpes it injects it, it, it injects itself in your DNA, so you have it for life. But this yeah, this guy has like, found a cure. But um, yeah, this is kind of a hot topic now. There's these last months many many people who've been injecting DIY gene therapies in themselves to become stronger or smarter or to cure themselves or whatever. Um, there's also this guy. <laughs> I'm not even going to say it. I'll just let you read it. Um, but this is a bit like, yeah, we, we should, I, I, I'm happy to go into more detail afterwards. But to be short, it's, it's kind of dangerous. It's mostly a show because if you inject it here, it just stays here. And then it doesn't really go anywhere. So it didn't work. It's probably not going. It's probably going to modify a few cells where you inject it, uh, but for the rest, it's not really going to do a lot. You're not going to change it. Like <laughs> a guy in Ghent that I know, he injected himself with a spider gene to become spider. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't. It's not really going to work. And then you, you have to shock yourself with electricity because it makes it go in the cells. And like people do crazy things. And it's mostly it's mostly stunts at this point. It's mostly stunts. Um, and you can have your opinion about it. like there's transhumanists who really are like yes this is it this is going to be it uh, but for me this kind of shows that if people can start doing this like biotech is is deservant of some some more debate than it is uh, than it is having now because things are becoming very fleshy at this point it's not coding into bacteria it's really uh, people are doing things like that so um, Another interesting thing that I find is the Personal Genome Project. It's been around quite a while. Maybe the data people here will know about it. Um, it's basically an open database online of, of genomes of people. So a genome is every letter of DNA in someone's body. Uh, and, and this is a repository of people, of open source people, who have donated their DNA, their sequence, to the database online. And, and you can just download them. So I, I did that a few times. It's actually a bit creepy and funny at the same time because you can download it in five minutes you have someone's complete genome and then not only the genome but also the traits so you have like okay 120 kilos 63 years old a bit of a high cholesterol uh, some weird diseases or whatever uh, even like faces like photos from every angle of the face you can find online so people some people are very very open source online <laughs> it's a bit it's a bit creepy but um, it's, it's an interesting thing. It has been around quite a long time. Why? Because, um, well, it's, 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 it can be a gold mine. This genetic data It's like uh, really, really popular with big data companies now because, well, there's the hope that it can say a lot about a person. I must say that the most algorithms based on genetic data are for now educated guesses or frauds, uh, if, you, if you look at it negatively. But, it's the hope that at some point this genetic data will lead to personalized medicine, to personalized food, things like that, that you can cure every disease, like no more disease, no more dying, just becoming, uh, becoming old without any problem. But of course, yeah, the, 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 the potential of that hasn't really manifested itself yet. 
Um, but it's, it's also important to talk about this, and I think this is kind of a solution for it, to have it open source, because there can be quite fundamental abuse of, of genetic data in the future. Uh, there's the same uh, pessimistic scenarios of people saying, well, genetic data and insurance, well, like you're much more prone to cancer or whatever, so what does that do to your insurance? Um, so, yeah, a lot of discussion around that, but it deserves a discussion in its own. I won't go into it too much. Then, um, this is a project here in Belgium that we are involved with with Reagent, Open Insulin. The goal is pretty simple, to produce the first open source insulin production protocol that is simple and economical. Um, you may or may not know, but insulin was the first genetically modified, uh, or produced by genetically modified bacteria a long time ago. But it's, it's a pretty sad story of the farm industry because the price has been rising by about 1,000% uh, the last 10 years, uh, with the production cost of about 20 euros. A vial now costs uh, 250 euros. So there is this, this questionable thing going on where insulin is very expensive. People in, in, in first world countries are dying from diabetes, basically, because it's too expensive. Um, whereas the, the production protocol is not that, not that hard, but it's patented. Um, so, we are working on that, uh, an open source production protocol. It started in San Francisco. Um, we have joined, there's also a team in Sydney. Um, well, the South America teams are not really operative anymore, but Cameroon and Senegal and India are now popping up. Uh, and this is pretty important because, yeah, an open source production protocol would, would mean at least a 50% price drop. And in Belgium, we were just talking about it in the other room, this would be about 50 million euros uh, savings for the government in returns on your bon uh, uh, and uh, all that. I don't want to make advertising there, but to see, like, open source pharma could be a game changer. Um, we're working on it, it's going slow, but it's a moonshot, so we need to, ca to keep at it. Um, if you want to contribute, go to your local biohacker space. Um, other projects are a different nature. Oh, this is a picture of some insulin that uh, they made in San Francisco. Uh, it doesn't look like that in your body. It doesn't light up. <laughs> uh, this is a marker to make it more visible. It's the one of the few times that you can actually see what's going on in biotech. This is, um, well, this is a cooperative that we launched, Mama Nebula, with open source biomaterials. So this is a lamp that's fully biodegradable, except for the light, of course. Um, it's based on coffee waste, and it's made with, uh, with the mushroom. Um, so we, we have a small company around that, and we work also with, uh, open source. Um, now we also engage the, the community in that area. Uh, yeah, these are all designers learning to work with the biomaterials. We are running out of time, so I'm just going a bit through it. Um, we have an open source water project, so we're going to measure the water in Ghent. Uh, that's also something that you can do in a bio, biohacker space to, to do like E. coli infections. Well, to measure E. coli infections, don't do E. coli <laughs> infections. We are harmless. Um, yeah, we do a lot of, of, of education, so as I said, uh, we involve children in biotech because education now, like if you're lucky in, in, in school, you get to do the parts of the human body, which is like the height of how exciting biology gets, but it's actually more than that. So we're trying to give children also a, like a relevant education there. Um, and we focus on underprivileged groups as well, because they don't really ever get to see it. Uh, so yeah. Who says that people with disabilities come to science? Well, they can. Uh, and they like it. We also train teachers. Uh, yeah, we do a lot of things. That's why I'm running a bit out of time. Um, these are other initiatives in Belgium that are also doing it. Um, but they're all not so active uh, at this point. Uh, but I hope they will. I hope more labs will start so that we can do more of this open biotech. Mm -hmm. My last slide, I thought, well, what's in the future? All these things that I've been talking to, it's quite scary. It's quite whatever, like, I don't know, unpredictable things happen. Like, people start injecting themselves with genes. This would have been unheard of one year ago. So I don't really know what's in the future. Like, some ra something random can happen. I don't know. But I think this is, this is what I hope that would happen in the future. Uh, I hope there's more open infrastructure for biotech, because that enables people to do things like open insulin, to really break these, these very, very harmful uh, monopolies. I hope that we have more open conversations because this gene therapy thing, like, this should be discussed, like is this okay? It's, it's, it's actually quite outside of the law right now, but as well as the ethical implications of, for example, pharma uh, monopolies that are actually artificial at this point because it doesn't take so much money to break them. Um, and then the equitable foundation. So we do a lot of work around including different people from different walks of life. 
and we think that's important because the research you do becomes more relevant. But also, when you have someone like the other in front of you, it becomes also harder to patent your thing and say, well, no, you're going to pay 10 times the production cost for my life-saving medicine that could help you. You're probably not going to do that when they're sitting next to you. Uh, so I think more people should be involved in uh, the process of biotech. There we go. Thank you.